Hello everybody, welcome to our webinar on child discipline without punishments or bribes. My name is Dr. Blaze Ryan, founder of Parent Learning Club and author of Democratic Parenting. So on this webinar, you're going to learn three discipline rules for democratic parenting and why punishments and bribes are actually the least effective way to discipline children. We'll also learn some simple communication tricks that can help kids listen better and the real secret to having children respect and trust you. Also, we'll talk about the most common mistake that most parents make when it comes to teaching their kids discipline. So first, who am I and what makes me an expert on child behavior and why should you even listen to me? Well, my name is Dr. Blaze Ryan and I'm a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. So that means that I focus on treating the root cause of disease, not just the symptoms. And when I became a parent myself, my training in Chinese medicine led me to question the standard approaches to parenting from the old school authoritarianism approach to the modern day permissiveness approach. And I thought to myself, you know, might there not be a better way, a simpler and easier way that's not so stressful for myself as a parent or for my child. And so my desire to learn how to be a better parent led me to founding Child Brain Health and ParentLearningClub.com. And um, through my research and through some dumb luck as well and just meeting the right people at the right time, I came across this method of parenting called democratic parenting. And uh, I wrote a book on it. Uh, which you can get on Amazon.com, which explains the whole thing. Now, I didn't invent this term or come up with it. I just tried to simplify the methods that uh, that are used to to um, to create this type of democratic environment in the family and with your children. So that's uh, enough about me. Let's talk about discipline. And first off, I want, is it even possible to teach children self-discipline without using punishments? bribes or rewards. Well, that's what we're going to explore in this webinar. And first, I want to start off by saying that um, I don't have all the answers because no one can tell you how to raise your child better than yourself. All I want to do is explore the idea of using a more democratic approach to discipline or discipline from the heart instead of using fear-based discipline, which is elicited through the punishments or through using bribes. So what is discipline anyways? Well really what it's all about is just doing the right thing, isn't it? But you know we don't always know what to do, like what the right thing to do is in any given moment. But there's a paradox in that because even though sometimes we're not sure about the best way to proceed at any given moment or how to, what the right thing to do is, deep down inside we do know right from wrong. So one of my favorite children's stories is called The Three Questions by John J. Mutt. And this is based on a story by Leo Tolstoy. And I wanted to just try to share parts of this story because it helps us kind of set the foundation for understanding uh, a more democratic approach to discipline. Um, so the, in this story, there was a, a boy named Nikolai. And he sometimes felt uncertain about the right way to act. So he came up with three questions. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? And what is the right thing to do? And Nikolai had three friends, uh, a heron, a monkey, and a dog. So the heron answered the first question about the best time to do things. And, and the heron said, to know the best time to do things, one must plan in advance. The monkey said, you will know when to do things if you watch and pay close attention. This is kind of funny because you can see from this picture that there's a coconut about to fall on his head. And then the dog said, you can't pay attention to everything yourself. You need a pack to keep watch and help you decide when to do things. So Nikolai thought about it and then asked the second question. Who is the most important one? The heron replied, those who are closest to heaven, obviously referring to, um, to the religious leaders. The monkey said, those who know how to heal the sick, obviously referring to doctors and healers. And the dog growled, those who make the rules, obviously referring to those who are in power. The boy then asked the third question and the, uh, his three friends answered as well. And I won't go into the whole story uh, because we actually have a lot of information to cover during this webinar, so I'm going to go through it all 
fairly quick so that we can get time to answer some questions. But after, um, after the boy asked the three questions to his friends and they answered, he was still unsatisfied. So he went up the hill to visit an old sage who was a turtle. And in, in this journey, he discovered the answers that he was seeking. And here they are based upon uh, Leo Tolstoy's original story. And this is a picture of uh, Leo Tolstoy's wife and, and daughter, a painting. So I thought I'd throw this in here to honor him for these three questions and answers. And the answer to the first question was, the most important time is now. Because it's the present that has the, the power. That's where the time, that's where the power is, is only in the present. We can't affect the past and we're, we have minimal power to affect the future as well. The most important person is whoever you are with. And the most important thing to do is to do good to the person who you are with. And so this is the spirit in which we approach discipline from a non-punitive and not non-rewarding kind of perspective, is to try and teach children the right thing to do from, from this perspective. So how can we do that? How can we teach them, uh, our children the right thing to do? Well, we can, you know, we can obviously get them the story and, and read that a few times, but, but still, you know, that doesn't affect them when they misbehave. And, and ultimately, children deeply want to behave well. So we have to kind of start in, in our approach with children from the, from the ground up, from, from when they were first born into this world, innocent and filled with love and filled with brightness. And children want to have our approval, and they want to feel accepted and connected with, with those that are around them. So they, you know, they, and they're also deeply aware of what's fair. And we, you know, as parents, we see this all the time, if, especially when we're with multiple children. If one child feels that an interaction or an exchange was unfair and they're getting the short end of the stick, well, they're going to let us know about that real quick. And so they, they inherently have a strong sense of what's fair and what's right and what's wrong. Also, I believe that children are naturally generous, loving, curious and empathetic because when I see children who have no stress and all their needs are met and they're in a, in a loving, nurturing environment, then that's how they act. So, but why don't children always behave well? Because sometimes they downright misbehave. But first, on, first off, let's explore why, what's wrong with punishments and bribes and rewards to begin with. So punishments, it's, it's a kind of forced coercion. Right? And they don't, they don't work long term. And it uses fear of pain or loss, whether that's um, fear of physical pain or physical loss, like something being taken away, a toy, or emotional pain of being scolded, reprimanded, humiliated, or emotional loss of just having being isolated and taken away from, uh, from people. And, and the, this type of forced coercion is, a, is a, a way to try to control the child. But it all uses fear. Okay, and um, bribes corrupt a child's natural respect for the situational needs of everyone concerned, and it paves the way for selfishness, greed, entitlement, and manipulative and deceitful behaviors. Okay, and rewards, you know, in and of themselves, using rewards to celebrate life and achievement can be great fun, and there's actually nothing wrong with rewards, but rewarding for good behavior and for just normal participation can easily have the same effects as bribes. Okay, so that's something we really want to consider when we start to use rewards if it's just a way to bribe them into good behavior and respectful um, group participation. Um, you know, or if it's just to or if it's just to celebrate life and achievements and new beginnings and these types of things, which are, are a wonderful thing to do. So both punishments and rewards elicit fear. They elicit uncertainty and stress in the child because we have fear of the punishment, okay? And we have fear of not getting the reward, which is it like a punishment itself. If we promise them a reward, if they're, if they're going to be good on this specific thing, then they're going to be uh, behaving out of fear of not getting the reward, which is, um, you know, is the, the lack of a privilege or something. So that in itself is a punishment. So both punishments and the promise of rewards use fear to try to control them. Now, fear triggers the stress hormones in the body through the fight or flight response. 
Now, if you've ever watched the Childhood Stress Disorder or read the book Democratic Parenting and the chapters on stress, you'll understand what I'm talking about here. Um, we need to understand the psychology be behind a child and how they get stressed and how the stress affects their behavior. You see, children are 100% dependent on adults for their very survival, right? They need us to be fed and to be housed and to be kept safe, um, you know, for much longer than most species. Most species, you know, within a short amount of time, they can be completely independent. But for children, the, this uh, dependent stage lasts much, much longer. And anything that threatens or undermines their sense of connection with the adult, their parent or the caregiver, will trigger their instinctive fight or flight drive for survival. Because they feel that if the connection between themselves and their caregiving adult is broken, then their very survival is threatened. This is a deep instinctual drive, okay? It's not a rational or a logical thought process. It's a deep drive that children have because of the natural dependence that they have as, uh, as the species. So whenever, children will feel stress whenever they experience feelings of disconnection, criticism, isolation, or confusion. All of these things create a type of disconnect and will cause the stress response to start in the body. Now bribery encourages entitlement. And the bribes escalate, right? And we all have experienced this. We can start off with a small bribe, but soon the child wants something bigger or they want more or they're just not as interested in what you're offering them anymore because they know how easy it is to get what they want through the manipulation uh, of you, basically, because you've kind of set them up to manipulate you through offering bribes and rewards. So they play your game and then they start to up, up the ante a little bit and the demands increase. And soon, you know, parents can feel like they're hostages of their child because they set up this, this framework um, to, to, of participation and relationship by introducing bribes in, in the first place. So common punishments, we already went through some of these, right? We talked about revoking privileges. Like this, so there's, main, there's, a main, the, there's a few different categories of punishments. First, we have like the revocal of privileges. That includes grounding no TV, video games, internet, taking away toys, you know, whatever, uh, stopping activities, less uh, reading time, um, they have to go to bed early, you know, not, they don't get to stay up late, whatever it is, those are types of uh, punishments. We also have isolation, timeouts, you know, go to your bedroom, that type of thing. There's also threats, right, countdowns, uh, the yellow, orange, red card system, right, this is what I'm talked about, it's just, that's uh, just building up, giving them warnings and threatening them that something is going is, is to happen, a punishment is going to come if they don't make an adjustment in their behavior. Uh, then we have scolding, right? Raising your voice, yelling, berating, humiliating them, all types of um, punishment that, that fall into the category of scolding. And of course, we have physical abuse, spanking, pinching, pulling, you know, or using the rod in extreme cases. Now, let's talk about quickly about some of the common bribes that we see being used, and we talked about those as well. Now, we're going to just explore some of the different categories of bribes um, that pretty much all the ones that, um, that you guys shared with me fall under these different categories. We have material bribes like toys, clothes, you know, things, whatever, whatever they want. Um, you know, we could just get them the, these things as a promise for something. Edible bribes, right? Candies, treats, favorite foods. Um, it can be used in terms of under the edible bribes and then rewards, right? Stickers, privileges, toys. And then of course we have emotional bribes. And this is something that people don't always take into consideration, but our affection, time with us, um, recognition, uh, you know, giving them acknowledgement, encouragement, just like, um, you know, the star student in a classroom will get this type of uh, emotional bribe and sta status too, right? Again, uh, um, a uh, top student might get a special status in a classroom or the, the, the child and the family who behaves the best might get a special level of recognition, status and affection that goes along with that where the more naughty or misbehaving child will, be, uh, will not get these things. And that is actually, like I said, a type of punishment where they don't, don't receive this bribe. Okay, so what's the alternative to punishments and bribes? Let's go into this. What is democratic discipline? So democratic discipline has nothing to do with politics, okay? People ask me all the time, why is it called democratic discipline? It has nothing to do with politics, and it's not religious, but it's based on trust and respect and communication. It's based on connection, 
and mostly on love, okay? And it's based on having the sense of being in this together as a family, right? Or as a community or as a group in a classroom. And that breeds cooperation and participation in and of itself, okay? So just by having that sense of being in this together, and deeply that's what children and most humans want more than anything is that, uh, that sense of belonging. It's a deep need that all of us have, the, the need to belong, the need to feel connected, and the need to participate with others because we're social beings. So that's a deep-seated need. So if we can create an environment where that need is being met and, um, and it's being nourished, then children will naturally cooperate and participate um, with, with little effort. Now, I go through this in great detail in my book, Democratic Parenting, which you can get on at democraticparenting.com if you don't already have it, or on amazon.com. And the, this whole book basically outlines um, democratic discipline and the different methods involved in it. Now, like I said, people ask me all the time, is democratic parenting or democratic discipline, is it political? Does it mean that your kids get to vote? No. It's called democratic because it teaches children to be responsible with power, choice, and relationships. They don't get to vote on when they go to bed or what toys they get or what types of rewards or bribes they get because that just ends up being a type of bribery and, and negotiation and that type of thing. Okay? It's really, again, about teaching them to be responsible with power right? Because we want to teach them responsibility because there comes a time when we're not there as parents to be with them and to help them know the right thing to do, okay? And that's what discipline is all about. We want to inspire a self-discipline in our children, right? So they will grow up and to be responsible adults and they will make the right decisions and have good judgment around power, around their choices, and within the relationships that they get engaged in. And Democratic discipline uses communication, a type of what we call connective communication, kind limits, natural consequences, and three important rules. Now let's go into what I call the three rules of democratic discipline. Okay? So, um, so wait, Elsa just got a quick question here, and I'm just going to take a little break from, the, from this presentation. If any of you have uh, questions, I will stop just for a two-minute question break just to break up the presentation a little bit. Elsa asks, how do we teach responsibility? Well, that's what you'll see as we go through um, these three rules. You'll see that how the responsibility is basically taught through our own example. Because you see, as parents, we, we have the, uh, the natural authority, right? We have the natural power over our children. And if we want children to be responsible with power and to be responsible with choice, then we have to demonstrate that through our own actions um, and our reactions and our responses to them. Okay, we have to demonstrate that level of responsibility where they look up to us and they see, okay, well, our, my, my mom or my dad, of course, they have power over me to some degree because they're my parents and they're the adults and I'm dependent upon them, but I can see that they're being uh, responsible with the power and they're making responsible choices and most importantly, they're being responsible and respectful in our relationship, okay? And that's a big part of it, is that we want to teach this through relationship so that they will relate to us and they will relate to others in that same respectful and responsible way, okay? So what do we mean by natural consequences? Okay, we'll go into that shortly. There's a whole chapter in the book, Democratic Parenting, on natural consequences, so I can't go deeply into the whole thing. But um, it's basically the difference between natural consequences and coercive consequences is that coercive co consequences is a type of punishment or it uses manipulations and threats. Natural consequences is we use that in a safe environment to allow them to experience the natural consequences of their actions. So if we weren't, in, if we weren't there to, uh, to change anything, what would be the natural consequence of the situation? Now, there's a time and place for natural consequences. We can't use them all the time. And uh, that's why, you know, that's why there's an entire chapter in my book written about it to explain the, the right times to use it and the, and the times when it's not so appropriate. Okay, how do you teach uh, twins to respect each other? Okay, that's a, a bit of a bigger question. We might be able to maybe ask that to me again at the end, Tammy. I might, might be able to get to it. Okay. What about children who are used to punishments, threats, etc.? Does changing to this type of parenting produce results? 
Um, that was from Sheena, definitely Sheena, but it, it takes time. You can't expect an overnight shift because what we're talking about here is a fundamental shift in the way you communicate and relate to your child and the general environment in which you, you raise your children in, um, not just the physical environment, but the emotional and intellectual environment and the tone and the pace that you have at home that will help them to uh, feel respected and therefore give you back respect. So this type of shift in parenting produces big and drastic results. And, uh, you know, I've had parents tell me just within a few days of practicing these methods, where previously they used threats and um, treats and bribes and punishments, created a, a major shift just within days. Other parents, depending upon the case by case and the situation, it can take longer. But it really depends on your personal situation and your, your environment and, and what you have available um, to you to make these changes. Okay, so that's, um, uh, there's another question from Anisha, but let's just hold it there for questions. We'll jump back into this presentation. So if you can um, save the, these questions for the end, I'll come back to them. All right, so let's talk about the three rules of democratic discipline. The first rule is you got to know when to be firm and when to be flexible. Okay? Expression said if you're going to play the game, boy, you got to learn to play it right. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. And you know <laughs> All right, I love I love that song. I love Kenny Rogers for especially that song. And I I love that section because it's so true, right? We need to we need to find that balance so that we know when to hold them, when to be firm, and when to fold them, when to be flexible and uh, and be a little bit more lenient. So the rule number one is all about when to be firm and when to be flexible. Now this refers to several things. We're talking about rules here, okay? Rules in the house or in the school, we have to be firm a lot of the times and we can't bend a lot of the rules. But there are times in specific situations when it is appropriate and more beneficial to everyone and to the situation at hand to be flexible with the rules, okay? We can't be too dogmatic, we can't be too firm, we want to be like a tree, okay? We want to be a tree, firm and strong, yet flexible, so if the wind blows, we don't break, instead we bend, okay, when the wind is very strong, all right? Okay, attention and, um, and uh, focus, right? We need to be sometimes firm with our attention and our focus and not get distracted by a child's behavior or their demands, okay? Um, oh no, let's see, I just, uh, you guys just said that the audio didn't work. Oh wow, that was, anyways, I, I should have sung it out for you, but it was Kenny Rogers singing know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Um, but I'm not really th that great a singer, so I'll spare you that, that suffering right now by hearing me sing. But it was just a little clip from Kenny Rogers, know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and that is to, to teach, to help us remember uh, that sometimes we need to be firm and sometimes flexible with, uh, like I said, with, our, with rules and with our attention and our focus and um, also with our priorities, right? Sometimes we need to be firm with our priorities. We need to get to school on time. We can't be late. And sometimes, you know what? It's, it's more important to be with our child and to help them through some strong feelings or some strong emotions and to just skip school and skip work, okay? If if the well-being of our child's entire emotional uh, makeup is going to be aided by us taking a, a, a mental health day away from school and work to spend time with them and to give them a lot of attention, then I think that priority is much greater, right? So sometimes we need to be firm and sometimes we need to be flexible with, with our priorities as well. And power and control. That's the other thing we need to consider here is, again, sometimes we need to be firm right, with power, by holding that power and by just demonstrating them responsible ways to, uh, to use the power um, that we have as a parent or as an adult with a child and also with the control. But sometimes uh, the most responsible thing is also to demonstrate flexibility with that power and control and to let them uh, take the lead a little bit on that uh, at the same time, you know, keeping a, a very attentive eye on them to make sure that they're, they're doing all right with that. Okay. Okay. So, you know, it's all about balance at the end of the day. I can't tell you um, when the best uh, time to, to
to be flexible with rules are, when the best time to be firm with rules are. I can't tell you, uh, you know, when to be firm or flexible or to shift your priorities. Um, that's for you to find out, and it's all about balance. So by using this, these democratic parenting and discipline methods that I'm going to be showing you um, and exploring this new approach to parenting without punishments or bribes, you're going you're gonna to discover for yourself where that balance is and when is the right time to be firm and when is it the right time to be flexible, okay? Okay, so, um, so Sana just asked me, what do you do when your rules are broken? Well, like I said, you know, that's for you to figure out because sometimes you have to be firm and that's the time when you use the technique what I call setting kind limits. You have to set a kind limit. But sometimes you have to be flexible and realize that it's not really about the rules and it's not about what they did, but there's some deeper underlying need um, underneath their behavior which is at play here and that is the biggest priority for us to address, not the rules. Okay? Okay, so the next rule is to respond situationally instead of reacting emotionally. All right? So what this means is that we want to reflect on the needs of the situation. Okay, we want to consider, um, you know, all the needs of the situation, all the people involved, and, and respond from that perspective and not react emotionally, not react out of our own stress or the, the child's uh, behavior that's triggering us. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is reflect on the, on the needs of the situation and really see what's, what's the most, again, the, the biggest priority. Okay, it takes us back again to the rule number one because obviously all these rules work together uh, at the same time. And then also, you have to ask yourself what you need to do in order to have more patience and less stress in your life. You know, I, I hear from parents, um, you know, a lot of time, they, they talk about, um, the, the issues they have in getting their child out of their home and to school on time. And so that they're, they're, their child isn't late for school and also for, so that they're not late for work, right? Now, um, you know, and when, when I probe a little bit uh, more, we, we come up with the, the deepest intention and the biggest priority that that parent has for their child is for their child to be happy. Um, and then through deeper probing, sometimes, uh, and more often than not, I find out that the parent, the adult themselves, are miserable at work and they hate going to work every day. So, you know, and, and I have to kind of, you know, we kind of have to take a step back here and think of, of how, um, how rational and logical and really sane it is to, to get stressed and upset and get into arguments and fight and hurt your child's feelings um, just to get them out the door so that, so that they can go to school and so that you can be on, on time for a job that you hate all in the name of having your child happy, it's not going to work. That approach just simply won't work because if you want your child to be happy, you have to be a model of that happiness, right? You have to be happy yourself. If you want your child to behave properly and to know the right thing to do, then you have to behave properly as well and know the right thing to do uh, as well and, and to react less. So. So what we need to do, though, in order to get there, we really just need to kind of take a, an inventory of our life and, and look at those aspects of our life that are stressful, uh, perhaps unnecessary, and that have a, maybe a, a higher cost than benefit, okay? Now, this can be activities that we do. This can be relationships that we have. Um, this can be, um, you know, priorities that we hold, rules that we stand by, um, you know, even principles and beliefs that we might be stuck to that maybe we inherited from our parents um, unknowingly and then that and those those beliefs have been kind of like a, a shadow over us that are just holding us back from really experiencing all the joy that life has to offer so rule number two okay we need to move away from emotional reactivity and we need to respond to the situation and what's really necessary in that situation and the only way for us to react less emotionally is to make sure that we're getting enough me time, that we're taking care of ourselves and we're filling our own cup as, as parents and as adults. And if we find that impossible, if we find that, you know, we're, we have too many kids and we don't have enough time and not enough money to make that all work, then we just need to, we need to schedule at least enough time so we can sit down with a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and write out what you're doing in your days 
and write out also possible resources that are might be available to you if you if you reached out a little bit more or if you made some adjustments in your schedule to make room for different relationships or different uh, interactions so that you can maybe call on some more resources to help you right so maybe there, there might be people in your community friends family or community resources that can um, offer maybe some babysitting time so that you can take some time away from the kids and do whatever you need to do to refresh and rejuvenate yourself whether that's you know sports or time in nature or time with family or friends or whatever you need to do just to refresh and fill your own emotional cup so you can come back to your child and when they do misbehave because they, they do and they will and they will test us no matter what type of discipline we use whether it's democratic or not children naturally um, need to grow and expand so they will test uh, pretty much any limit that you put there with them the only thing is is that the longer you use democratic parenting and democratic discipline the, the less the, they'll find the, the need to test those limits because they, they just trust you. And when they do test those or when they do misbehave, it becomes much easier to find a solution around that because they're much more available to actually communicate with and to figure out how you can make some adjustments and be a bit more flexible in what you're doing so that, that, so that you can create a, a relationship and an environment where you're working together, adult and child. Okay? Okay. So let's go on to the next rule, the third rule, okay? We want to respond to the root cause of the behavior, okay? Now I talk about this again in the book Democratic Parenting or if you've ever seen any of the other webinars, this is kind of one of the foundations of democratic parenting is to address the root cause of the behavior, not just the behavior themselves. And I talk about the roots and the fruits uh, to, to give a, a metaphor or an example of how this works. We talk about the fruits as being what we can see Okay, so that's the results that we have, the symptoms, the behaviors, or the problems that we're experiencing and dealing with. The roots, those are the things that we can't see, but those are the causes, okay? Those are the causes, the reasons, the motivations behind what we're seeing. So the fruits are kind of like the behaviors, the tantrums, the defiance, the lying, the, uh, you know, the, the lack of cooperation, the ignoring, the, you know, whatever, the whining, the nagging. Um, those are all the behaviors and the symptoms. The root causes is what we need to address and understand. So at Democratic Parenting, we talk about the three root causes for behavior. The first one is the legitimate unmet needs. And if you ever uh, watched the webinar I did on the legitimate unmet needs, you'll see that there's three categories of needs that we have, you know, the physical, emotional, and the mental. And then there's 15 specific needs that children need to have met within that as well. But again, I can't go into that in detail right now, otherwise we'll be here for an extra couple of hours. So, but it, we just need to understand that children have some basic needs. And um, let's, you know, we all know our children well enough and, and we're, everyone on this call is very smart. So share with me some of the needs that, that, um, that you feel children need. If you can just want to type out in a box here, or just take a moment to, um, to, uh, to hear what some of you have to say around, around what children need. For them to be happy, to be content, um, to be inspired, to be stress-free, to have clear thinking, good judgment, to behave well, attention, yes, that's right, Amanda writes that, love, time with parents, they need to be listened to, said Teresa, free time, definitely, yeah, they need just free time, unscheduled time is so, is so wonderful and especially in, in this day and age where everything's so busy and go, go, go. It's just wonderful to have free, unscheduled time where we can just laze around and reflect and process our busy life. I believe that they're loved unconditionally. Yes, definitely, we need that. Um, recognition, love, and time. Sleep, definitely, children need sleep. Unconditional love. They need to be fed on time. They need to get enough sleep. Rest, love, attention. Words of encouragement quality time, food, shelter, yes, attention. They need to feel love, safe, trust, that the adults around them feel, they need to feel competent, yes. They need one-on-one -on -one time, respect, nutrition, rest, transitional direction, yes, they need direction, guidance around transitions, structure, good sleep, proper eating, habits, free time to themselves and quality time with parents. Excellent, yes, exactly. Those are a lot of the needs, all of those needs fall un under this category. So 
you know, we need to, when if a child's not getting, um, as having some needs unmet, then they're going to be driven to behave in ways where they can somehow get those needs met. And that, that, that driver is a deep kind of instinctual thing that's beyond, um, beyond their, their ability to reason out of their behavior. A lot of, a lot of, um, discipline methods that, that more modern parents and more, um, you know, uh, permissive parents use is a type of reasoning and explaining and talking with their children to try to explain to them uh, the right way to behave and why the way they're behaving is the wrong way. Um, you know, and there, to, there is merit to that in cert certain circumstances, but for the most part, if they're being driven by one of the unmet needs or stress, uh, which is the next uh, cause, then they're going to be behaving in a way that they beyond their ability to control themselves, okay? So we, we, they won't be able to compose themselves no matter how much they want to because sincerely and genuinely children want to behave in ways where you're going to approve of. So they're, they're behaving in these difficult ways because they're being driven to by these deeper needs, okay? And then we, so we have the next one. The next reason why children misbehave is because of the role models or the, or the models they have in their lives. They're modeling the behavior around them. And we all know that children are natural born models. That's how they learn how to walk. That's how they learn how to talk. That's how they learn to relate. That's how they learn how to do everything, is that they see how humans around them uh, do these things and they model that behavior. Now us as parents are their primary role models. Then we have siblings and then we go outside the home and you know people in our environment, in our communities, and even um, the behaviors that children see on TV or in video games are types of uh, become role models for behavior that they might use as well. So we need to look at this, okay? We need to look at whether when our child is behaving in difficult ways and we want to ask ourselves, what is the root cause here? Do they have a deep need that is not being met? Or are they modeling behavior from elsewhere? And then the third one is stress. Is my child stressed? Are they feeling under pressure? Are they full of tension? Okay, stress is a big one. And I see that probably 80% of the time when parents come to me, uh, whether it's in these live webinars or whether it's um, for the one-on-one -on -one personal coaching or in my clinic, when I'm working with parents in their, uh, with, around their children's behavior, especially in the more uh, challenging behavior like uh, aggression or violence or some of the ADHD or even some of the autistic type of behaviors or the, the defiance, um, you know, that, uh, the tantrums, those types of things, I'd say 80% of the time, stress is the main cause of it. So uh, we talked about earlier how using punishments and bribes actually increases stress, right? Because it elicits fear that punishments are a form of control based on fear. And rewards, offering rewards for good behavior also elicit fear because the child has a fear of not getting the reward. And whenever there's fear that is prolonged or intense in uh, the child or even an adult, it causes the, the fight or flat, flight or fight response where the, the adrenaline and hormones get released into the body. And these hormones actually limit their ability to think clearly, to, to function um, in, uh, in more responsive ways, and they become much more reactive in, in their approach and, 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 and um, in their relationships. Okay, and I, again, I'm not going to go too deep into stress. There's a whole chapter again on democratic parenting and how the, we talk about the four causes of stress and the eight ways to heal from stress. Um, and we go deeply into that, but I'm not going to go too far into this in this webinar because again, we want to we want to go through this information quickly, and I just want to give you an, a, a good solid foundation of how to use democratic. Uh, discipline with your own child and to move away from punishments and bribes, okay? So let's uh, go a little bit more into some of the democratic discipline methods, okay? Some of the, the techniques are what I call, it's kind of like your toolbox, okay? When you, when you start to use the, dem the methods that I talk about in democratic parenting or in these webinar series, um, th these, all these different methods become like tool, tools that you can put in your toolbox. So when your child does misbehave, right, or you find yourself wanting to use your, your traditional approaches of uh, rewards or, or punishments, now you have new tools that you can call on, okay? So the first one is connective communication. And again, there's a whole chapter in this in my book, uh, but connective communication is simply just using communication, your verbal communication, in a way that enhances the sense of connection with your child, 
okay? When you scold or when you yell, that increases the disconnect, okay? It increases the distance. It has the opposite effect of connective communication. And if a child's, um, you know, uh, sense of uh, survival and well-being is so much dependent upon their sense of connection with their adult, anything that breaks that connection just sends them into this stress response and this survival instinct and they, they start to react more and then they listen a lot less, okay? So the, the more you raise your voice and the more you yell, the less your child will listen to you. And if you don't believe me, test it out for yourself or maybe you've already been seeing that in your family, right? That's why you have to escalate again, punishments or escalate bribes in order to get the results, uh, the same results after a while. So connective communication is a great tool that you can use. And in connective communication, we use our tone of voice and the words, the specific words that we choose to be more connective words and eye contact as well in our body language. We want to use all these things together to really enhance that sense of connection, um, the sense of compassion, and for your child to really feel deep down in their gut that you love them unconditionally because we talked about you know everyone wrote down in terms of what children need they need that attention that sense of unconditional love right so you know if we take away these these fundamental needs from them as a forms of punishment they're just going to start reacting any even more because uh they're unable to think clearly or to process clearly um the the what, what you're talking about and the reason they're getting punished uh because they're they're, they're reacting out of the, the lack of this missing need. But if we can meet all their, these needs and enhance this kind of uh, the foundation and the root cause uh, of their behavior so that then, then when they do misbehave or they do something that's out of line, then you can reason with them in a way that they will listen because their needs are being met. Therefore, they can be more present because they're not as stressed. Okay, so that's how that works. So another method that we use is setting kind limits. Okay, and this is uh, what the main method we use, especially if a child gets aggressive or violent or throws temper tantrums or that type of thing. We, we want to set limits, um, you know, or if a child breaks a rule that uh, we need to be firm on, okay? That's when we set limits. So whenever we use the three rules of democratic discipline, and the first one we, just, we, we need to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And at some point we say, okay, we need to hold it here. We need to be firm uh, at this point with our child. Then we want to set the kind limits. Okay, that's when we use these. And kind limits, they're, they're firm, okay, yet they're caring and connected. Again, we don't want to disconnect from our child because that will send them to, into the stress response and make them less able to listen and to think clearly, okay? Then another great method that we use are family meetings, okay? And this is a democratic style of family meetings. Again, there's another, a whole chapter on this in the, in the book, Democratic Parenting. Uh, and we go through the, the way you can set up these family meetings uh, and different ways that you can use them and the purposes behind them and some of the needs that are met by them. But the, the main focus of these types of meetings is really to increase that sense of connection. Because, uh, and what it does is enhance uh, what I talked about at the beginning of this webinar, that sense that you're really playing uh, this game together, that you're in this together as a family, and therefore the child feels nourished by their participation um, in activities and by their cooperation with you. They feel nourished by that, therefore they want to do that, and they, they enjoy doing these things rather than uh, resisting them and, and being defiant, okay? And then natural consequences, okay? Again, that's a, a, um, when we allow the natural consequence for for something to happen. So for example, if a child goes to swimming lessons and um, you know, and after swimming lessons you, you tell them, okay, you know, uh, hang up your, your wet shorts. Or if they're old enough, old enough, you don't even have to tell them, right? And you want to kind of teach them to take that responsibility for themselves. So you can even stop telling them at a certain age um, and they should, you know, remember to do to put away their stuff depending upon uh, you know the environment and the routines that you set up in your home. So in this circumstance, you know, you kind of expect your child to do this, and then they, what they do is they just throw the 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 uh, wet wet their wet shorts or their wet swimsuit on the floor um, in the bathroom or in the in the tub, and um, and you see it there, and your your tendency is to kind of yell at your child or to pick it up or you know say something to them, but to use natural consequences, what you want to do instead is to say nothing and to do nothing and to just leave it there, and so then two days later or whatever. When you, it's time for your child to go swimming again, you know, and they're looking for their shorts, they find these wet 
shorts <laughs> that they have to put on. And they learn from that the natural consequences of not uh, being responsible for their things or for their actions or to doing basically what's right. Okay, so that's just an example of how you can use natural consequences with your child, and it's a it's a fantastic way to teach them the um, the true uh, consequences of um, of their decisions and their choices and their actions. Um, but again, you know, there's a time and place to do to do and to use natural consequences as well. Okay, so um, again, all these types of um, these methods are listed in the book Democratic Parenting, and there's even more, but these are the main. Uh, discipline methods that we use in democratic parenting to set that up. So you can, uh, if you don't already have that book, I highly, you know, uh, I wrote it, so that's why I recommend it. But I wrote it because there's a strong need for it. Because after years of um, of uh, working in, in parent learning club and and in child brain health, uh, you know, just I, I get the same questions from parents again and again, and a lot of them are coming from uh, the a lack of information, less less so out of circumstance, and you know, it wasn't because their their children. Um, uh, their children were, um, you know, had less less opportunity than anyone else, or that they had less opportunity than anyone else. But um, but really, because they didn't have this this information that 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 I had discovered through my years of research into this type of, of parenting style. So I just wanted to put it together in an accessible format. So that's why I put together this book. So um, so that's it for this webinar. We're going to go into the uh, question and answer period now. But I just want to let you know that coming soon. Next week, actually, we have another webinar specifically focused on dealing with anger, violence, and aggression in children. So when children get aggressive or violent with, with uh, other children or with their siblings, how can you respond in a more democratic way, in a way that can help them get over this behavior and return to that, that connection and that, that care with others? So that's next Thursday, uh, same time as well. And um, next month, we're going to be doing another parent leadership certification program um, where we actually go through a, a five-week uh, um, session where we, uh, we go through different modules and uh, we, we dive deep into the uh, dem democratic style of parenting and um, the eye care system as well. So that's next February. And you can learn more about that at uh, the, the link here that you can see at parentlearningclub.com forward slash um, leaders. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, we have a bit of time now that, uh, that I can do my best to answer them as much as possible. What is your opinion of, starting, of using start charts? Do you consider them a bribe? Well, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think you mean like star charts, reward charts, sticker charts, that type of thing. Yes, I do think that is a type of bribe because, again, you promise them a type of recognition or sometimes prizes for behavior. But again, it really depends upon the circumstance. Like I said, with rewards, there's, there's a time and place for them where they can be really fun um, and, and uh, they can be useful to encourage them to succeed and to, uh, and to expand. And just, again, like I said, for, you, know, you can use them for fun. But when you're using these types of charts for behavior or for participation, things which I personally feel should be a, just a natural response um, to relate, and to interact with those around them, I would not use these types of charts. Instead, we can use the, this type of democratic parenting approach to set up the environment where they feel more inspired to participate and to cooperate without needi needing to the, these types of charts and that type of thing. Okay, so um, let's see here. Please elaborate on kind limits appropriate for angry, bossy, defiant seven-year-old refusing to go to bed. Okay, so, um, so okay, we have a seven-year-old who's uh, defiant, angry, and upset, and they're refusing to go to bed. And how would you use a kind limit in that situation? So uh, basically, we would just use our communication um, and our tone of voice and our presence to let them know that now is the time to go to bed and that they really have no other choice in that circumstance. Um, and, uh, but what we want to be careful of when setting this limit is, again, that we don't create, that we don't want to react or get upset. Now, they probably will, okay? Um, and that's what we talk, I talk about that in the chapter of kind limits, that it often leads to an emotional meltdown or a tantrum it can go to. And I also talk about how to handle those because those can be wonderful healing opportunities um, when a child has a tantrum. They're very healing as well. So, 
uh, what we want to do is again just set that you know with our presence and our attention we create a, cir a circumstance where there's just no no other nothing else for them to do than to go to bed that we're just going to be there with them and we're going to help them go to bed um, but we're not the, but we're not going to you know play any of their games of distraction or let them you know kind of dilly dally so much that we're just going to be with them and lovingly but yet firmly let them know that that's where um, that that's the next step is to go to bed okay so you know it's 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 hard for me to kind of go too deep onto into exactly what to do in that situation because there's other circumstances involved in, in any given scenario um, but I would recommend you know to read that chapter on kind limits because it's quite a thick chapter and I give different examples in there as well um, you know in, like um, here Bruce just said you know a great point is that you never want to let your your tone change from anything but love okay and that's you know even though you can be firm and you can be serious you want your child to, to feel that love coming through, okay, um, coming coming through your communication as you set that kind limit. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so one uh, one person asked, asked uh, what should I do when my son doesn't cooperate at diaper changing time? Okay, so that's uh, Antonio asked that. Um, how old, how old's your son? I'm assuming he's pretty young there. If uh, if uh, he needs his diaper changed, and um, you know, so but but to talk about that, there's a, a we, again we have to look again at the root cause of their behavior. Why are they not cooperating with diaper change? Do they have an unmet need? Do do maybe they need a little bit more time with no diaper? Okay, right after they they go pee or poo, and you know that they're not going to do anything for a little bit. Maybe you can let them play around without a diaper a little bit. Um, you know, or, or maybe they just need to, a little bit more connection as well from you. Uh, and, you know, a, a great way to, to do that with a really young child is just, uh, you know, some way elicit their a connection with them through talking or singing or playing a game or, you know, eliciting some natural giggles from them. Um, and then they'll be much more cooperative in terms of, um, in terms of uh, letting you change your diaper or whatnot. Okay. Um, Let's see, how do you maintain a consistency when so much of the school system is based on rewards and punishment? Uh, that's a question from Sheena. That's a great question, Sheena. Um, and that's, you know, that's a really unfortunate thing about our school system is that it is based on rewards and punishments. And there's, there's not so much that we can do about that um, more th other than just take our child out of the public school system. But it's not always optional for us to take our children out of school um, or put them in a private school, which has fewer punishments and rewards. But um, you know, if that if that opportunity is open to you of putting them in a, in a more of an alternative type of education system, like like the Waldorf system, for example, um, where they're, they're not so focused on um, on tests and rewards and punishments, but it's a, a different way of educating children, then you can always try that out. Um, otherwise, it, you know, just always remember, take heart knowing that uh, your the home is the ultimate foundation for your child. And if they feel that they have your unconditional love and your unconditional encouragement and belief in them, regardless of what happens outside the home, then that will really help them develop a, a strong um, and more resilient character in life. So I hope that answered that question. Let's see. Um, so let's see, Elsa asked, do you recommend uh, to use visual charts to help my child with getting to school on time? Um, I'm not sure what, what you mean by a visual chart there, Elsa, but, uh, you know, as long as it's, it doesn't uh, threaten your child in any way or they don't feel like, um, you know, coerced or bribed into something through this chart, then, you know, uh, we can use all types of things to kind of help them stay on track as well. Um, Let's see, what about going to bed? My children would be up all night if I didn't coax them into staying in bed. Okay, Sally asked that question. Okay, well, there can be many reasons for that. Again, we have to look at the root cause here. We can't just look at the problem or the behavior. You know, we talked about the roots and the fruits earlier in the webinar, and the fruit in this case is that the child doesn't want to go to bed. Okay, that's the result. That's what we're seeing. That's the behavior. 
but we have to look at the root cause behind that. There could be many factors involved there. Um, you know, uh, and I, I have, a, again, a chapter in my book called Smart Sleep, which I talk about the, the whole bedtime routine and how to set up a, a routine that kind of encourages them into sleep a little bit more and makes that transition a little bit easier uh, without needing to use punishments or bribes. But again, we can look at other things we can look at, you know, their diet, maybe they have some type of physical allergies with foods that are just kind of setting them off at night and making them more wired. Maybe they're not getting enough exercise as well during the day. And, you know, this might not be the case for you, Sally, but I'm just giving some different examples for maybe other parents who have the same problem, is that if the children aren't getting enough exercise and they're not feeling that physically tired, then they might, again, be more wound up at bed as well. Or maybe they're having too much stimulation in the evening that they're watching TV or playing video games or too much screen time. Or maybe they're uh, up leading up to bedtime is just too much of a busy schedule, too much over emotional or mental stimulation, again, causing them to be a bit more wired. Um, but like I said, there are some, some wonderful kind of democratic style of uh, routines that you can set up uh, leading up to bedtime that just kind of uh, make that transition so much smoother uh, and not have any types of coaxing or resistance necessary at that time. Okay, so Don asks another question. Let's see. How do I encourage communication with my child uh, while the communicating, while he gets distracted and forgets uh, what he needs to do next? Okay, too much talk, talking gets him derailed. Okay, great question, Don. I'm so, a I'm so happy you asked that because, you know, more often than not, we talk and uh, use reason and use uh, rationales and logic and, and explain things too much for our children. Okay, Chil our children are incredibly intelligent and they're absorbing everything around them and they're learning at incredibly fast paces. So we actually need to explain, um, you know, uh, much less than we think we do. And when it comes to types of uh, communication around behavior um, or around what needs to be done, you know, if our child's getting distracted, uh, or they're, you know, they're getting forgetful about what to do next, then we, we need to take a look at our own communication, how we're communicating with them, what we're saying. We need to look at our tone of voice. We need to look at our body language. And we also need to kind of take a step back and see how our child is responding to, to what we're saying. Okay? So maybe uh, with your son, maybe find a different times to talk with them. You know, take the, find different opportunities where maybe you can do something together. Children, especially boys, uh, they really kind of develop uh, deep bonds and, and, um, and communicating while doing something physical, playing a game, going somewhere, uh, you know, doing something with their hands, or, you know, can be a great way to create that connection and to really get through to them. So um, that's what I would recommend for you, Don, is to just try to maybe talk less around, uh, you know, when it's unnecessary and leave things more open-ended for him to explore. And when it is necessary to talk, you know, again, just be aware of your tone of voice and the circumstances and the timing of that. Uh, you might find perhaps better times where he can be more attentive as well. Okay, I hope that's helpful for you. Okay, another question we have from Allison. Uh, she asks, if my child is out of control, how do I give him space and time to calm down without calling it a timeout? Great question. Well, what, see, the timeouts typically refer to isolating them. Okay, so you take them away from whatever they're engaged in and you make them go alone and it creates, it's an isolation technique which creates major disconnection and we talked about how disconnection increases stress, okay. So we don't want to do isolation but we want to give them space and time. Typically the space and time that children who are getting out of control or hyperactive or wound up are looking for is not so much right at the time when they get wound up but it's even before then. We have to look at the root cause again of the behavior, what led up to this, this out of control behavior, what led up to the freak out or the blow up, okay? And then we need to make adjustments for the future because sometimes, you know, what's done is done, the, the, the milk has been spilt and we can't do anything now about other than just clean it up and to just be a bit more careful next time, okay? So we can create, by creating more space and time in our weekly schedules so that maybe your child's schedule isn't so full that they have time just to lounge around and to get bored, for them to be bored, for them to discover what, um, 
what uh, the uh, the um, one author of a great parenting book called uh, Simplicity Parenting, Kim John Payne. It's a fantastic book. He calls it the gift of boredom, right? Because boredom is just that's out of that's from where the this deep creative um, instinct for, that we all have comes from is this boredom, right? So, but nowadays it's like there's a deep fear of boredom. Um, that we all have. We try to overstimulate ourselves with, you know, little gadgets and screens and busy schedules and communications and, you know, we're, we're going from here to there all the time and we find ourselves having less and less time and feeling more and more stressed. So giving your child space and time to calm down, to process their experiences, to be more present, to relax more and to just kind of uh, allow them an opportunity to be bored and to discover their own in, in, you know, imagination and their own creativity to how to entertain themselves without you know, gadgets or excessive toys or um, you know, video games or televisions or these types of passive entertainment to do away with the passive entertainment and give them that space and time to, uh, to develop their own internal creativity is a great thing to do. So you know, again, look at your, your weekly schedule that you have with your child. And maybe just look at the priorities around that, and you might find opportunities where you can you can stop doing this and take out that, and you know, and just start making more free time for them to 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 um, to experience more presentness in their life. Okay, so thanks for that question, Allison. Hope that answer was helpful. Now, Elsa asks, um, she's nine years old, typically developed. Her brother is thirteen, and is in this and in the spectrum. He needed a visual chart for many years to get him through the morning routine. Oh, okay, so that's it, right. You had the question about the visual chart. Okay, I'm still not sure what this visual chart is referring to, but like you know, if it works, like I said, if it works <clears throat> and uh, you don't feel like it, it's causing them fear. If it's working without eliciting fear or threatening them with fear of uh, a punishment or uh, takeaway or something, or um, and it, or the not getting reward. You know, if it, they're not pr a promise of reward for behavior. Or, or getting to school on time, you know, then it seems harmless. But again, just you know, double, you know, to, to, you know, question it. Just take a moment to question, you know, if there might not be an alternative if it is listening for you in order to to help them um, get out the door on time. Okay, Patsy asked the question. The difficulty I have is school is based fully on the rewards and punishments. Okay, so my son works on that model um, a great deal. Yeah, so that's true. Like I said, Patsy. Um, you know, because the school system is based on punishments or rewards, uh, you know, we have to provide a different environment within the home, which again is a deeper foundation anyways, that they're loved unconditionally and they can explore a more type of democratic style of discipline. And you can just you know, let them know that that's how they do things in school, but at home we do things differently and we do things as a team. We're a family, right? So, so that's why we're doing such and such. Um, you know, and I hope that... Um, my, my sincere hope is in the future the school system will shift and change and, to cr and create a, a, a deeper sense of democratic or heart-based discipline, right? Because if, if a teacher has the children's hearts, okay? Um, Gordon Newfield uh, wrote a book called Hold On To Your Kids, and he talks about this concept in, in great detail. He calls it, you know, having, holding on to your, your, your kids and having them, them having your heart, right? And... Um, and, and then they will naturally want to cooperate. It's the same thing that I talk around connection. If there's that strong sense of connection, then they, they, they feel like they, they have your heart and you have their heart and you're working as one. You're, you're part of a team. Okay, so they'll want to, they'll want to cooperate. And they'll want to develop and create things with you. And my hope is that the future school system that we can develop together will um, we'll use that model more so than the punitive or fear-based type of model. Okay. Great. So next question, Oretta, when I choose to use natural consequences, my children try to turn it around and make it, make it my fault that they don't have wear, clothes to wear because they didn't put them out in the wash or they didn't get their homework done because they chose not to do it or wanted to stay up late or stay home from school to do it and I won't let them. Now, now do I let them know that those are natural consequences and not let it turn into a fight? Great question, Aretta. Um, in that type of situation, um, the natural consequences may not be appropriate. So that's why, like I said, I really recommend that everyone read the book, the book Democratic Parenting, and the chapter specifically on unnatural consequences to see when it's appropriate to use these and when not. 
because we have to consider the age of the child. Um, you know, many children, they might be at a certain age that they're, they're, it's, it's not appropriate for us to assume that they will take responsibility for the natural consequences of their actions. Also, we have to consider the situation. Remember, rule number two of democratic discipline, respond situationally, do not react emotionally. So even though perhaps, Aretha, your children might, uh, might behave in ways where, are, you know, are great and they're putting their clothes up and they're doing their homework, um, but then something happens, maybe, you know, there's a festival or some other things happen in your life and the, and the situation changes and there's more stress um, and they have less time and their and their minds get distracted with, with all the stimulation, then they might not, um, they, they might, you know, just honestly forget a little bit about some of the responsibilities, in which case you might offer them a, a gentle, um, you know, and loving reminder uh, to do these things. And so again, you know, there's no, there's no set rule, right? When I talk about the, the three rules, these are very dynamic rules. And what these are all meant to do is to kind of enhance our awareness and increase our responsiveness and to decrease our reactivity, okay, so that we can create more effective change rather than just kind of get caught up in these power strike struggles or vicious circles, okay? Okay, so... Um, Teresa asks, what's the best way to handle a lengthy tantrum? Okay, I talk in my book about tantrums, and I have a webinar as well on how to heal through tantrums. Now, I'll just say that tantrums are, can be extremely um, a healing, okay? They're a natural response to heal from really strong feelings or emotions or, or um, to heal from pain or past hurts for children. But there's a time and place for them, and there's certain things we need to be careful of when assisting a child through a tantrum. One of those, we want to make sure that they stay safe, they don't hurt themselves or anyone else. And we want to also maintain that loving connection and uh, that connected communication with them so that they, um, so they, they know what, that we're there with them. We never want to leave a child to throw a tantrum by themselves. We want to keep that connection. So I won't go too deeply into how to handle a tantrum because, again, that's a whole, that's a, a, a pretty lengthy thing. So, uh, but you're welcome, Teresa, if you want to, uh, to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be happy to kind of guide you through that process as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, another question here. Okay, so Sena asks, he's not interested in any information except what he likes. So how to approach that? Okay, a child who's just picky and doesn't want to hear things that they don't like. Well, you know, that's, um, that's usually uh, that type of defiance and kind of, uh, kind of control pattern uh, might be caused by a need for autonomy. So maybe a child who might have a, a little bit more need for autonomy will kind of show those types of bossy or controlling behaviors as a way to have that need met. So you, what you can do is then just create uh, environments and cir circumstances and situations uh, to how to build more autonomy. Okay, then I can see saying that you, you say also that it's a daily battle to do is homework. Any advice? Okay, for homework, um, uh, my best advice for that is to just find a way to do it with your child that makes them feel like it enhances connection. So you want to kind of make a fun activity out of it, uh, the homework, that, so your child looks forward to just doing something with you, feeling connected with you, and working through the homework. Now, of course, it's not all you know, peaches and roses. They're not always going to want to do it. You know, but, but if you can, can create an environment where you are encouraging them through the homework and you're helping them along, then um, you know, not only does it meet a lot of their needs for attention and connection and encouragement, um, but also with homework, you also want to be really sensitive to um, inspiring them to, to think, think out the problems of the questions and just guide them towards the solutions rather than telling them solutions. You know, there's just some basic things here. But, and then through that, your child's sense of accomplishment will increase as they find themselves being more and more proficient. And again, if you're being there with them and spending that time and giving them the kind of that special play attention time as well, then you will nourish them in other ways and they'll be less resistant eventually. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Sally asks if I can give a kind limit for aggression. Um, okay, I, I'm not going to go into this right now, Sally. Um, for aggression, violence, that's a pretty big subject and we need to be really careful on how we we address that and how we use kind limits with that. So that's why I'm doing a, a separate webinar specifically on the subject next Thursday, the 24th at the same time. 
Um, you're more than welcome to join join me on that webinar as well. And there'll be recordings for that as well if you can't make it to the live one. Okay. Let's see. So Lynn asked, are you saying my five-year-old's defiance, backtalk, attitude will cease as long as I'm consistent with my kind limits and connected communication? Um, not necessarily that alone will do that, Lynn. Um, what you need to do is first is, again, just follow the, the three rules, right? Know when to hold them, know when to fold them, when to be firm, when to be flexible, okay? So there's times when kind limits are necessary to be firm, and there's other times where we can be, we need to be flexible and maybe uh, use natural consequences or another method. Um, the second rule is we need to respond situationally and not react emotionally, okay? And then the, the third rule is we want to address the three root causes of behavior, and that's really the most important thing. So we need to look at why the five-year-old's being defiant and uh, talking back, and they're, you know, they're having a strong attitude, okay? So when you know the, the reason for that, the deeper reasons, um, and you use the democratic parenting methods, there's actually 14 methods, okay, in the book Democratic Parenting, and they all work together. You don't have to use them all together at the same time, but they, they all kind of reinforce and encourage um, each other and enhance each other. So, you know, there's one called play attention time, which is really fantastic, especially for younger children like your five-year-old with these types of behavior. By using a little bit more play attention time with your child, that can increase their, um, their sense of autonomy, um, you know, and it meets a lot of their needs. This is, can also work well for you, Sena, when you asked about the homework issue um, or the, the resistance uh, issue around their, their, their need to express their autonomy. By using this method called play attention time, which is described in the book Democratic Parenting, um, that can go a long way. So um, to, to come back to your question, um, connective communication and kind limits are very effective uh, methods. And at times, just those alone can create a massive shift in your child. Um, but there are other methods as well that you can use in conjunction with those which are, which are effective and also which help meet other needs which might be at play. Because connective communication, kind limits will help meet specific needs, but there are others as well that if those are not being met, then your child's misbehavior will continue up until the point that you do meet those unmet needs. Okay, so Sukira asks, um, give me a concrete example of what would be a kind limit for a three-year-old twin when they hit each other or fight and not share and complain with the other is not sharing. Okay, so a three-year-old, um, now let's talk about sharing a little bit. There's a, there's a specific kind of age or um, uh, appropriate age where we can introduce the concept of sharing which with much less resistance. If we introduce the concept of sharing early on, children, you know, they, they go along with it because you're, you're telling them that and they're afraid perhaps of, of being punished or not having your approval or being scolded. So they'll go along with sharing at time. But we want children to just share out of the goodness of their heart, right? That's what we that's the type of behavior we really want to encourage, not because they know they're supposed to or that they have to or they might get in trouble if they don't share. We don't want them to, um, we, we don't want that to be the motivation behind their, their generosity. We want them to do it out of their goodness of their heart, okay? So three-year-olds, I think it's quite young. My personal opinion, it's still a little young, you know, maybe around more the age of four, four and a half, um, even five is when uh, you can start to kind of introduce the concept in a way to encourage them more. But if a child, my personal opinion is if a child is kind of, you know, younger and they don't want to share, then we shouldn't force them to share because, again, it causes great blow-ups and whatnot. So uh, with twins, you know, when you have, well, the best thing to do with twins is just buy them doubles of everything. So they always have two of the same thing, um, you know, not different colors, not different shapes, just two of the same, and then, they, you know, then they won't, then they won't get into issues. Now, if one of them claims both things of the, you know, both cars and, you know, withholds the other um, from, from their sibling and then that one starts to cry and freak out because they're not getting the toy, then uh, we, we need to know, we realize that it's uh, the reason why they're doing this is a deeper reason. Okay, maybe that child feels uh, stressed or hurt or their, their sense of connection is broken in some way or they have some type of need that is not being met, which is causing them to react in that way. Okay, so that's the deeper underlying root cause. Now to set the kind limit again with a three-year-old, what we could do then 
is, um, you know, if a, a child tries to, if one twin, three-year-old twin tries to hit the other, what we need to do is be there and be present and to step in. And what we can do is physically place our hand, um, you know, in front of the attacking child um, and, and stop them from hitting them. And we want to have a soft hand. We don't want to grab their hand hard or use any type of, or to show them any aggression in our action or any violence or any um, sharp or um, strong movement. We want to we want to because we want to fight the fire with water so they're exhibiting this type of fiery behavior we want to be more fluid more soft more more giving but at the same time we need to keep everybody safe so we keep uh, that we want to stop physically stop the child from hitting the other but have do so with soft hands and to use a loving tone of voice that connective communication tone of voice to say something like you know sweetie i'm not going to let you do that i'm not going to let you hurt your brother and you know, and we're looking in their eyes. We're saying it in a way where the child feels love, and where where our compassion and our love and our care for both of them is really coming through our voice and our actions. And that is is um, is is how I recommend to use the the method of kind limits for that type of behavior. So I hope that was helpful for you, Sukita. Um, let's go on to the next question. Um, let's see here from Warren. He asks. Would you consider use, utilizing an easy way or the hard way tactic punishment, uh, where the easy way is go to your bed without arguing with your toys or going to bed without your toys, for example? All said kindly and lovingly communicating, there's no real choice about bedtime, but there is choice about toys. Um, so, okay, I see what you're saying, Warren. So you're offering them choice and, and helping them meet that need for autonomy um, by, by giving them a choice of, of Having something with or without um, that 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 could that could do it, you know. Because uh, but I would take away the easy way or the hard way. Okay, so um, you know you could say that. Okay, you can go to. I would take away also the the without the arguing. Okay, just say you know if you want, you can go to bed with your toys or you can go to bed without your toys. But it's bedtime. Okay, so I don't you know it's fine with me if you take your toys. But you know it's fine with me if you leave your toys. But it's bedtime. But as soon as you, as soon as you even insinuate um, that if they argue or if they behave in a way that's confrontational or to your disliking, um, then they will have something uh, taken away from them. Uh, you won't let them have the toy. Then that is a, a form of punishment uh, or threat as well. So you're using a type of coercive uh, manipulation there to get them to go up. To bed, even if you say it kindly and lovingly, there's still that that fear, right? That they better not step out of line or argue. But you can just simply say, you know, that uh, you can go with or without your toys, but it's bedtime, right? And that is being firm and setting a you know a kind limit that it's bedtime, and there's just no other time than bedtime right now, right? And um, you know, and and uh, you know, for bedtime, like I said, there's a whole chapter of different ways that you can set up a routine to make that ease, easier in my book as well that you can go into. Okay, uh, Tammy asks, what to do when a six-year-old keeps hitting you when he's upset? Okay, um, that's something, again, I'll go into uh, in the webinar next week around um, violence and aggression and the anger as well and how to limit that. But here we want to do set the kind limit and we want to you, same thing with the, the two three-year-old twins where they're hitting each other. We want to use our hands and our, our body to, um, to stop them from hurting us or from hurting themselves or anybody, but use the connective communication, our tone of voice and our eye contact to uh, maintain that connection, make them know that we still love them regardless of that, that, that you know, we don't like their behavior and we don't, we, we're not encouraging that in any way but we still love them and we know that deep underneath that behavior they're loving and that they're our, our, our sweet little child, right? And then that way we can go beyond the behavior and, and, and touch the root cause and the heart of the matter, right? Okay, um, what's the natural consequence for not wanting to do his homework on a daily basis? Okay, so that's Sena. Um, I can't remember exactly how old your child is, Sena, but um, you know, they're, for some children they're quite young, they need to, you know, we, we need to kind of, might need to remind them to do their homework if they're not thinking about it. But, uh, you know, what we can do again with the homework situation is we can just kind of create the routine in our daily schedule, again, where there's just homework time, right? And if we, if we create the environment where we do it with them, 
that there's connection there with us. Then we're meeting a lot of their, their, their needs and our needs for connection and attention while we're doing the homework. We don't have to worry about the natural consequences of not doing their homework because, you know, the natural consequences of not doing their homework is that they might get in trouble at school and they might experience punishments um, and uh, threats at school, okay, where we have no control over over that experience. They might be humiliated or teased or what whatnot, right? So, and it might affect their, how they view themselves as well because, you know, it depends, again, how the teacher communicates and how, how he or she responds. But we have no control over that. So, I would avoid, um, uh, I would avoid finding out what the natural consequence for not doing their homework in school. Uh, that's maybe something more for teenagers um, that we might, we, you know, where they're older and they're more responsible. We can let them kind of start to experience uh, the natural consequences if they slack on their homework. And again, we might want to touch in there as well, um, uh, you know, if, if need be to help to get them back on track if they start to get too far away from their discipline around their schoolwork as they grow older as well. Okay, Teresa asks, what is the best way to handle extremely stubborn defiance when no is just not accepted? Okay, um, well, so if no is not accepted, try and find another way to say the same thing. Other than no, we can say not right now. Uh, I'm sorry, sweetie, uh, we can't do that. You know, there's, there's other ways to, to say no, and then they'll, they'll probably still be extremely stubbornly defiant, right? So uh, we want to use, that would be a great opportunity to use the technique of setting kind limits. Uh, when a child is just being extremely stubborn and defiant, that's when we use kind limits. Okay, uh, let's see here. So, um, okay, yeah, so Bruce, our uh, wonderful um, editor-in-chief of the Democratic Parenting, he just uh, points out that Democratic Parenting doesn't just work instantly, right? So it's not a quick fix replacement to bribes. And that's true because we address the root causes which are, are, are longer lasting in many cases. You know, the, the child's deeper needs, maybe uh, overstimulation or stress or pressure that is built up in the child's life or their routine. So we want to address those and make the shifts on that deeper level. And that is what really creates the permanent lasting change and makes parenting so much easier because you don't have to resort to bribes and you won't get drained and have, having to escalate and offer greater bribes and greater rewards. And before you know it, you're going to be buying them a, a red convertible when they get their driver's license, right? <laughs> Just so that they do good in school or something like that. You know, and we don't have to cause the fear of punishments either because it creates a permanent shift in our whole relationship and in their approach because we're, we're talking deeper about uh, respect and trust and um, and how we relate and communicate with our children. So um, that, that's a great point. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Tammy says, how to get a six-year-old twins to respect and cooperate with each other. Um, okay, so, you know, again, what we want to do is look at the root causes, why the children might be acting this way. And, uh, you know, with twins or siblings, it's very common that they need to push each other and to test each other's limits, and there's going to be arguing regardless of what you do at, at times. But the more, the, the more you, sh you use these democratic discipline methods, the greater respect and cooperation that will build in your entire family environment, okay? We're talking about an entire family and home transformation, okay? So your, your twins will automatically start modeling and mimicking this approach that you're doing, and therefore will become more respectful and cooperative in how they relate with each other. Okay. Now, Pat Patricia asks, I have parents who use writing sentences hundreds as punishments. How do you convince, how do you convince parents that this will not work for kids who have issues with school anyways? Okay. So Patricia is obviously a parent, uh, or sorry, a teacher, and um, she has parents who, who use this type of writing, um, you know, writing tons and tons of sentences as punishment. Okay. I think I remember doing some of that in school myself. Um, so how do you convince them that this is not the best way? Well, I'd rec recommend to, uh, to give them a copy of Democratic Parenting or tell them to get the book uh, because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger thing. And we, what we need to do is kind of do a, a whole kind of, um, um, uh, you know, shift in how we view uh, discipline, how we view relating with children, and how we address their behavior. Again, we want to address the root cause of their needs not just the behavior themselves. So we need to make that kind of uh, deeper shift first uh, 
you know, otherwise it's really hard to kind of convince them. But but what you can do is just talk to them about, uh, you know, maybe different, give them different alternatives of what they, um, you know, what they could do instead. Um, or talk to them if you think their child might be, you know, a bit overstimulated or, you know, too, too busy in their lives. Maybe you can offer suggestions around there. But, um, but that's what I'd recommend. You know, the quickest and easiest way is just get them the book and, uh, and then they can read it at their leisure. And then from there, you can have a conversation about some of these deeper methods as well. Okay. Um, okay, so Tammy asks, what to do when parents have different uh, approaches to disciplining um, in a particular situation? Okay, that's a, a different point of view, right? Okay, that's a question I get all the time because oftentimes the two parents, they, they discipline very differently. One will be more authoritarian, one will be more permissive. And what I see time and time again is that the more one is authoritarian, the same degree the other is permissive. So what we want to try to do is just try to help support the other parent as much as possible and talk to the other parent about what's happening, but in a supportive way. We never want to feel the, we never want to make the your, the other parent feel um, feel in any way, you know, uh, threatened or demeaned or disrespected in, when we're talking about how they discipline or how they parent. Okay, because that again that creates a disconnect and they just shut off. So we, we can use the exact same methods we're talking about here with our partners, uh, our spouses, or parents, or even other adults, because we're just talking about relationships here, how to relate in a respectful and a democratic way where we respect each other's powers, each other's um, uh, autonomy, and we and that helps us build trust because we we work and try to create a win-win situations and find solutions and, and focus on the solutions and of the needs of the situation rather than on, on our own kind of emotions and our own reactivity. So that's that's kind of the approach we want to take. Uh, Leah asks, my son who was used to getting rewards um, such as candy constantly demands candy. How can we handle this during the transitions of not using bribes? Great question, Leah. So she's uh, her son is used to getting candy as a reward and now she wants to transition away from bribes, how can they handle this issue? Well, um, what will most likely happen is your child might have a few big, you know, uh, emotional releases. They might cry, they might tantrum, they might refuse to do what's being said, but you need to really stick to your guns when you're making this transition away from bribes. Um, you want to stick to your guns because I see a lot of parents where they, you know, they refuse to give in to a bribe and they refuse and they refuse and they refuse and the child starts to, to pull out all the different methods and, and um, trigger their, their parents here and there. And then finally, the parent gives in to some type of, you know, agrees to kind of a lesser bribe or agrees to the original bribe or, or you know, offers them something completely different, which is, again, just a different bribe. So, but we want to stick to our guns. When we're, when we're making the transition away from bribes, we need the child, we need to teach the child that the bribes are over. We can't start, as soon as we start offering bribes, we set the precedent, we're setting the stage to build up that sense of entitlement, to increase the demands, and we're going to have to go through the whole thing again if we want to try and transition away from bribes. So once we cross that line, we don't want to go back, okay? So we just set, we, we just got to be firm within our own hearts um, that, that bribes are over, and, uh, and we want to communicate that, of course, in loving and empathetic ways because it's not going to be easy for the child to accept that and to deal with that because it's not their fault that they got used to taking bribes for good behavior, right? Um, quite frankly, you know, the, us, us adults are the ones who set up this environment to, to create these expectations or the sense of entitlement. And we need to take responsibility for that to be really empathetic and considerate and compassionate during the shift and to really just be, uh, let the child, you know, kind of go through their emotions that might come up um, as you make this shift. So the, in my book, there's a chapter on healing from stress, um, you know, and, and uh, I talk about tears and how to handle tantrums and crying. And that's a good one to read because those things can definitely come up as we start to limit bribes and rewards. Okay, so um, let's see here. Um, so Santa asked, being with him for moderate guidance and training is always helpful. Wanting someone to be with him during the tasks, uh, not attempting to solve the problems. Is perfectly capable. Okay, great. Um, just that just looked like a comment there. Um, how do you figure out uh, the underlying needs that need to be met? Okay, so Allison asks, how do you figure out these underlying needs that the child has been met? 
what an excellent question. That's the same question I asked myself when I started to uh, to use this type of parenting. You know, what what are these deep, deeper needs? And that, you know, that's I came up with 15 specific ones that I isolated that are practical that you can use. And I do I do have a webinar on that um, that you can watch the emails. It's going to be I did the webinar a couple of months ago. I'm not planning to do another webinar on the subject, but hopefully what we can do is is offer the podcast for this webinar for everyone who's interested in this uh, pretty soon. We're just redoing our whole website right now, so that'll soon be available to uh, to everybody. Uh, so you can actually, if you're listening to the recording right now, you can go to our website at parentlearningclub.com, and you can probably find access to the, this specific webinar recording on the 15 essential childhood needs. If you're listening and watching to this uh, watching this live, it won't be available right now. But uh, you know, what well, you just want to start asking yourself, just start asking yourself what what could be what could my child need right now, and maybe take a piece of paper and a pencil, you know, and and just go through it, okay, and start with the behavior. Ask yourself, okay, my child is uh, behaving, you know, being defiant or being aggressive with their sibling, uh, and this is the behavior. What could be their underlying need under underneath that that is causing that? You know, I've you know it's, it's quite often we see with um, you know the when a when a family has their second child and the first child is only a couple years old or maybe two or three years old and then a new baby comes into the picture it's very common for that first child to start misbehaving or acting aggressively towards that to the new child because that child is feeling feeling the effects of less attention they're needing a little bit more attention they're needing a little bit more reassurance and sometimes it's only like ten minutes more a day. That that all that's all the child needs to make all the difference for them to feel like their their need for attention is fully topped up. That's you know sometimes it's just a small amount, a small adjustment we need to make to to meet that that need for a child. So the asking the question is the is the is the first step for sure. And uh, I hope that kind of um, gives you something to start with, Allison, around trying to figure out what the what these needs are. Um, okay. So Santa asks, what is the best approach when a problem is immaturity in comparison to his age, which is eight? Okay, so, you know, um, saying what's the best approach? Okay, so we're talking about age appropriate, figuring out what the child needs based upon their appropriate age. Okay, and there are specific kind of developmental stages that we need to be aware of, uh, which can help us figure out what they need. Um, but the but you know what we but we we definitely want to be aware of uh, whether or not they need just in more information if they're too young and they haven't uh, received the information they need to uh, to make better decisions or to be um, more careful in their um, in their behavior so sometimes that's all they need is just a little bit more a bit of information um, but you know the the age appropriate is uh, is a big one to consider but another big one is the circumstantial situation as well that we need to look at. Okay, hope that helps you, Sena. Um, how do you limit screen time without turning it into a punishment? Great question, Aretha. So you just say that uh, we've decided that we're going to do um, less screen time. We're, we're, gonna, we're going to do less um, TV, less video games. Um, you know, we're going to spend more time doing, you know, playing board games or, um, you know, doing, going for walks or doing something else. So you can replace it with one thing, but just simply communicating it honestly and genuinely that we've decided, and I recommend using the word we because, um, you know, you're talking about both parents or in the home in general that, you, that you're the leader of, um, you know, I, you could say I've decided that we're going to watch less. And by saying we, you know, it's kind of drawing them, you're, you're kind of helping them through that. You're, by saying that we're going to watch less, even though you're referring to them, you're kind of putting out your hand and saying, hey, you know what, I know that this isn't going to be easy for you because you're used to a fair bit of screen time, but I'm here with you, okay, and I'm going to help you through this transition. So that's one thing you can do. Hopefully that's helpful, Aretta. Thanks for that question. Okay, so Lynn has a question. How can I make my five-year-old not get so frustrated when I'm trying to teach him something? I recognize when he's tired and try to avoid teaching then, but um, but he's so hard on himself if he can't get a concept the first time, even though I explained numerous times to really help him get a concept. Okay, that's a great question, Lynn. It's, it's, some children can be really sensitive or they can kind of develop that pattern where um, they place a lot of their, um, 
you know, um, a lot of their self-worth or their um, kind of sense of personal power on how quick they can figure something out or get something or a concept. So when they can't get it, it can be a, a source of frustration, major discouragement, and even stress, right? Some kids get really stressed about not getting the answer right or getting things perfect. So um, what, what I would do is, uh, is just try to encourage him and to really focus on encouraging him as much as possible. And that's wonderful that you're, you know, that you're aware of when he's tired. It just shows how wonderful a mother you are to be that sensitive, um, you know. And so, so you're aware of that need, and uh, and you just look at, you know, maybe just question: Are there some other needs that might kind of help him get in a better um, frame of mind before you 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 do the teaching, right? Does maybe need some exercise, or need to have a bit more uh, downtime, or maybe you know it needs to be explained in a different way. Um, or maybe he just needs a little bit more encouragement as you go through the process. Uh, you know, so that's the best I can offer you, Lynn. I feel that there, there's probably more there for your son, um, but without knowing the entire circumstances, uh, that's about as, as good as I can offer. You can always um, contact us if you want to do um, a private session with me and, and explore this issue more. Okay, so Sally asks, what's your opinion of screen time? Um, if taking it out would you recommend cold turkey or all at once a slow decline in TV time? Um, well, that really depends upon how much TV your child is watching, you know, um, how much screen time they're watching. If you can do a cold turkey, if you can replace it with other things, um, you know, and make that happen, sure, why not? If you find that that's, uh, you know, it's going to be too difficult and it's going to be a cause of you more stress, then, you know, maybe you can do a little bit more slower. So that's... Um, <laughs> That's my opinion. Is it, it depends on the circumstance and the situation. Okay. All right. Uh, the best way to handle obsessive behavior. That's a question from Teresa. That's a great question, Teresa. Obsessive behavior. How do we handle that? Um, in my book, I refer to obsessive behavior as like control patterns. And there's a specific uh, section in the chapter on setting kind limits of how to limit control patterns and to help children through that. So I'd recommend reading that because, um, again, obsessive behavior has a whole different uh, etymology and we need to understand the, the causes behind that and, and how to kind of help them out of control patterns or obsessive types of, of issues. Okay, Tammy asks, what can the root cause of a child taking things from school like from, or from friends, stealing? That's a great question, Tammy. What could be the root cause of a child who's kind of gets, uh, starts stealing and taking things? To be honest, um, I don't know, you know, because there's lots of circumstances that would be involved here with your specific child, and without knowing their entire history, um, I can't tell you what the root cause. It could be multiple things. It could be multiple needs. It could be a certain type of stress or pressure, or maybe they even modeled something. Maybe they saw something that made them feel that they could do that or that it would be okay. Or maybe they heard something somewhere um, inside the home or outside the home even that kind of kind of set the stage for them to start to experiment with that. Um, you know, or maybe and sometimes it is just a matter of they're just experimenting with something, uh, exploring things, and they don't actually know that they shouldn't do that. And that's why they sometimes just need a little bit of information around that. So depending upon the age, that's all that it can be sometimes is they just need a little bit of information knowing that, you know, that it's not okay to take things from school or to steal uh, without asking. Um, you know, so that's sometimes all it is. Okay, but uh, that's the best I can do given the little bit of information I have on this circumstance, Tammy. Thanks for that question. Let's see, Moti asks, um, how do I help my four-year-old to understand the importance of not hitting anyone he's unhappy with? Okay, so, um, so again, uh, I'll go into this a little bit more in next week's webinar on dealing with uh, anger, uh, aggression, and violence in children. And uh, because this is a, a bigger issue here, um, and uh, we can we can give them information and explain it, but there's a deeper reason because you know we inherently know, and children inherently know that hurting another one and hitting them um, is not is not the right thing to do. So, but they're being they're being compelled to do that for reasons which are beyond their own control, um, and we'll go into into that. And part of it again has to do, of course, with the three reasons for underlying behavior stress, um, pressure, trauma, those can often be big causes of this type of behavior. But I recommend, Moti, that you join my webinar next Thursday to, uh, to learn more about how to deal with this anger and aggression. 
Okay, so Sena asked the root cause. What's the root cause of being lazy um, at the age of eight and how to deal with it? Well, it could be many things, right? Um, they could have some unmet needs, maybe need for more exercise, a little bit more vitality in their life. Uh, um, maybe, um, maybe that they, uh, you know, the the diet, some nutrition aspects might be affecting their energy or their clarity of mind. It could even be their their sleep things. There, there could be lots of different things at play for this for this laziness you're talking about. So Sally asks, when making the shift to democratic parenting, is it important to discuss with the children? or to just start doing it? My children are seven, five, and three. Great question, Sally. No, just start doing it, uh, especially with children at that age, okay? I would stay out of the mental and out of the mind as much as possible um, because we don't want to turn this into an intellectual thing. We're talking about relationships and communications um, and uh, just, you know, the environment that we set up is, is being more around respect and, um, and trust and uh, consideration. Um, so, so this is something we want to model more, and by using the democratic parenting methods, um, this these things model these methods model that type of environment, and the children will will pick up on that uh, fairly quickly, and will kind of follow into that. So, you know, there's the one uh, the one the one time where we kind of use maybe more words and talking like that is maybe in the family meetings, but again, your children are pretty young, so you won't go deep into the into that. Um, so. So that's, uh, that's, you know, of course, we've got to know, like I said, we've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And there are times when, um, when folding them means talking, right? Uh, or holding them means talking. So it's all about balance, and we need to find that balance, what's best for our kids um, uh, based upon our own situation. Okay, um, let's see. Um, are these needs available in your book? Allison asked me if these 15 needs are available in the book. Unfortunately, the 15 needs are not in my book. Um, I put these needs together after we published these book. Um, so I don't go through these uh, specifically in my book. But um, if you send us an email, Allison, at support at parentlearningclub.com. Uh, if anyone actually on this call uh, sends an email or wants to learn more about these 15 childhood needs, um, just send us an email at support at parentlearningclub.com. Dot com. Let us know that you're on this webinar and you're interested in learning more about these childhood 15 needs and Mary or one of our support staff will get back to you with that information. <clears throat> okay, so Lisa asks, um, can you elaborate on family meetings and how they work? Okay, so that, uh, that's a, again a pretty big subject and it takes up a whole chapter in my book. Uh, but basically the, the, the main essence behind democratic style family meetings is that the purpose and focus of them is to increase a sense of connection, okay? Um, therefore, it's less about trying to talk and to get information across, which, of course, you can do, and there are great opportunities to do that, but it's more to increase the connection. And they do change based upon the age, okay? So if, you're, if your child's quite young, then you might just play games um, during the family meetings and talk very little. But, you know, if your child's a teenager, you might spend a little bit more time talking, but also you have to keep the games and keep the fun there, especially for teenagers because they might even be more, more resistant to family meetings. Okay. Um, okay, so Sana says, I read your books and love them. I know the root cause. My child wants to be left alone. Okay, well, thanks, Sana. So that's, that's great. Thanks for the compliment. Yeah, so they want, maybe they just need more autonomy, right? They want to be left alone. They need a little bit more autonomy. Great, great. Uh, I'm glad you figured that out. Okay. Are you, your underlying needs that you came up with? Okay. Um, no, with no, with no instructions. Okay, that was the other point. Okay. So there's a bunch of questions. I'm trying to, to get through. Some of them are broken up here. Okay. How many times should I repeat a request? Example, dinner, go wash your hands and brush your teeth. Great question, right? Because we don't always want to be repeating ourselves. But if we get in the habit of repeating ourselves, I've seen parents um, quite often where they they repeat, they have to repeat it, you know, three or four times and they start to raise their voice and finally only when it's a scream when the child can kind of really sense in their tone of voice that they're serious now and that a, a, a real punishment might come next if they don't listen, then they will listen and go wash their hands or brush their teeth or follow the instructions. But we don't want to get in that habit, right, because we're just setting ourselves up for being drained and exhausted. So... Um, you know, we again, we have to follow these three rules. And the second rule is we want to think, um, respond situationally, not emotionally. So we have to think of the situation, basically where our child's at. What's the situation? Maybe 
they're um, they're preoccupied or they're with friends or they're playing or they're engaged in the game with a game with their siblings, so they're less attentive. Um, and, and you might need to repeat it a couple times to go wash their hands and get ready. Other times it might be very, um, you know, they can be very responsive. So you only need to say it once. But uh, what I recommend is to just try to keep the repetition to a minimum and find other ways to get their attention and cooperation rather than repeating things. So you might, instead of repeating it, you might go over to them and make eye contact or put your hand on their shoulder to make, uh, make some body contact. And repeat, repeat that same and say, sweetie, I just asked you to go wash your hands. It's, it's time we're going to have dinner now, okay, to, to get through to them. So that, that's another way that we can get through them with, with our words. Okay, Teresa asks, how do you get a child to come out of the house at the weekend for a walk or go to the shops or even the toy shop or anywhere without using bribes when a child is insistent that they want to stay in and that they're not going? Okay, so again, we can look at various needs, you know, that they might have and why they're resisting going out. Or maybe there, maybe there's also um, another root cause might be stress or overstimulation. Maybe they just feel that they need more downtime, need more time in processing, um, you know. Or maybe they have, you know, a deep-seated kind of fear based upon some tension of something that might have happened out and about that um, is still kind of traumatized them. Maybe, you know, they experienced some type of mini trauma or extreme trauma one time when they're they were outside or out and about, and that's why they have the kind of resistance to that. And then also you can use kind limits as well to just uh, let them know that you, it's time now that you're going to the shop and you want to be firm a little bit. And there's times too you might think, you know what, I can be a bit more flexible. Um, and you can say, you know what, you know what, uh, uh, maybe we can find something else for you to do. We can get a babysitter or some, you know, can do something else while I go out and do these things, um, you know. Uh, and also you can um, have maybe, depending upon their age, you can do a family meeting or have some communication with them about what is really going on for them and why they don't want to go out and maybe if there is something or some place they would prefer going. So again, depending upon their age, it might be appropriate to have that type of conversation and bring it up more in, in, uh, in the intellectual level as well. So you know, you can start doing that for children at seven age seven plus or eight, eight plus, you know, depending upon their ages, um, depending upon their own, sorry, their own um, uh, personal kind of growth as well. Okay, so let's see. Patsy says, I feel, I feel really depressed about my son's schooling as it's based on punishments and rewards, and I feel powerless to do anything. So that's Trisha. I know, Trisha. I, that's, it's, I feel your pain, and, and it's really hard when we, when we don't have much choice around that type of our education for our child. So, you know, uh, in, there's there's a couple of things we, you know, that you, you're not really asking for advice here. I know that you're just kind of expressing some of the, the feelings you have for this. Um, personally, I've made it a, a priority for me to offer my my child a, an alternative type of education. So um, it's and and that's been kind of at the center of uh, of a lot of the choices that I make in life is to adjust my schedule and adjust my lifestyle. Uh, in a way that he can get the type of education that I feel good about him getting, um, because it's not public school um, and it's not reward and punishment based. You know, and I know many parents who have gone to the to the extent of making the decision to homeschool their children rather than sending them to that type of educational system. And um, you know, and it's not easy for us to make these transitions. Sometimes we need to, if we do want to make that type of extreme change. Uh, for our child, and it might take years to to make that shift, so that we can, you know, work from home or figure some other type of uh, situation out that we can make an income and provide for our child and give them the type of education that we like. But you know, um, the only other thing that that we can really do is kind of all of us on this call and in the parent learning club, everyone who's part of a club, if we you know we can all just do whatever we can do to help make the education system better, to you know maybe give. Um, give teachers some of these democratic parenting books like the one that I wrote or there's others, you know, like uh, the Simplicity of Parenting, Holding On To Your Kids. You know, there's lots of other types of books that talk about this more heart-based discipline approach um, that we can pass on to teachers and that type of thing. And I do believe, you know, that, you know, 50, 60 years from now we'll look back on our present, um, present education system and, and really kind of shake our heads a little bit about, you know, some of the outdated methods we used um, and it's my hope that we get there sooner than later, and I believe with, with these wonderful parents that are on this call and in, the, in this club that we will get there sooner or later. 
so thanks for sharing that Pat Trisha I share your um, I share your frustration with that okay Aretta asks I have older teenagers and younger children five and ten how do I encourage the older kids to be more encouraging and less critical of their younger siblings that's a great question Aretta um, so uh, there's there's a family meetings using the democratic family meeting system is a great way to build connection between siblings because we engage the whole family in this type of family meeting which again a lot of it can just be game games and things we do to connect um, and that can help um, using natural giggles and uh, play attention time um, those are other te techniques in the democratic parenting book which are fantastic again to bridge the disconnects between siblings um, and, uh, and help them feel more connected and uh, yeah, just communication, you know, maybe spending a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time with the older child uh, as well so that they feel more connected and they feel more encouraged because oftentimes the older older child will feel frustrated that the younger one is getting all the encouragement because they're, they're younger and less capable. And, and then some resentment can kind of uh, kick in and, uh, and kind of motivate some of their less kind behaviors that might come out. So, um, so I, sometimes... Uh, when the, an older child is acting like that, it's really their, um, that's their way of, of letting you know that they need a little bit more encouragement and they need a little bit more one-on-one -on -one attention. Okay, so uh, Anisha said, did you get my question? Oh boy, let me see, Anisha, did you ask a question that I missed? Let me just scroll up here and I'll see if I can try and get that for you. Um, I do not see it anywhere. There's lots of questions here. I'm sorry, Anisha, I don't see the other question you asked. Okay, Lisa says, thanks. You're welcome, Lisa. It's my pleasure. So Sally says, do you have some strategies for calming down as a parent when you're alone with the children and you can't really get time by yourself? Yes, indeed. What I do mostly is I do Qigong or Tai Chi or meditation or yoga. Um, these are all things that I can do in my own home with my, with, with my children, um, you know, and I don't need to kind of go out um, you know, that's some way I can calm myself using some breathing practices, you know, just to kind of make myself a little bit more present and uh, move through the reactivity. Um, you know, and that also is, it's good to, uh, to take the time and to schedule a time during your week when you're not with your children, when they, you can have someone care for them and you can get your own emotional needs met. You can get together with friends or family and have fun with them, uh, that you can do some exercise. Uh, or do anything you need to rejuvenate yourself. Maybe it's go for a walk in nature or a swim. Anything that you like to do that really refreshes and rejuvenates you. Any type of recreation that you enjoy is to do that. And that will all help to kind of fill what I call your emotional fuel tank. And therefore, you'll be less reactive and more patient with your child. And then when you're with them and they're starting to freak out, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's good for you to take an adult time out. You know, and you don't want to, again, do that in terms of some type of punishment where they feel like you're, you've gone and you've left them or you've abandoned them. We don't want to create that type of situation. But you can kind of, you know, just say, okay, sweetie, I just need to kind of go in the other room and do some meditation or need to stretch or breathe or do some yoga for a little bit. And do 10 minutes of stretching and breathing help to bring you out, back into your body and calm down and outside your emotions so you can, again, react more uh, situationally and... Uh, uh, and um, less emotionally. Okay, uh, Sena says, with no self-discipline, we need to repeat essential requests and instructions all the time. So we learn to be che cheeky to be able to cope with it, right? Yeah, so again, by using these methods, the democratic parenting methods, and just practicing them regularly, um, you know, meeting their needs for autonomy and, you know, self-directed play and stuff like that, then your child will um, you know, their, well, their self-discipline will increase um, and then your, you need to repeat the request will decrease. So I would recommend for you, Sana, to, to try to reduce the repetition um, and find different ways to kind of get through to your child. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Anisha asks, how do you taper discipline with regards to a four-year-old with sensory processing disorder? Okay, so now the... Um, you know, I talk. I do a webinar on childhood stress disorder, and this is a, quite a popular webinar. I'm doing it again in February. Actually, if you go to our um, eventbrite.com 
page at parentlearningclub.eventbrite.com. You can see this webinar. You also get, you'll get a, a notification about it as well. It's coming up, like I said, in February on childhood stress disorder. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that, um, you know, I, I've looked into the, a lot of these different uh, childhood disorders that are in the DSM. Four and even in the DSM-5 now that uh, is used for diagnostic of mental disorders and stuff. And a lot of them are, um, are behavioral based, okay? They're symptomatic based. So I'm not always sure exactly what the behaviors or the symptoms that any particular doctor, um, you know, uh, has isolated in order to give a type of diagnosis like sight sensory processing disorder. But typically, that, what that means is that they have kind of some difficulty around their spatial awareness. Uh, they might bump into things. Um, you know, they might have a hard time kind of recognizing things in their environment. Uh, they're just kind of a little less present. And uh, more often than not, I've found that um, uh, the accumulation of uh, kind of chronic stress or a, a, a trauma or intense stress or the kind of passive stress which can be caused by uh, prolonged unmet needs can cause these same types of behaviors. So we need to kind of look again at the underlying root cause of the behaviors around whether it's unmet needs, whether there's some mo behaviors that are being modeled or stress. And not if we if we use uh, just some type of um, label uh, that is uh, is used to diagnose a child's behavior as the root cause then it often doesn't leave us with many, um, many kind of options in terms of how to resolve that behavior. So that's why we've created this system where we don't need to do drugs or therapy or anything like that to overcome a lot of different behavioral issues by just using these methods that you can use at home that are described in democratic parenting. So uh, Anisha, what I'd recommend for you is to, um, to put the label aside and just look at the, the behavior that your, that your child is showing and then to ask yourself what might be some of the root causes of this. What possible unmet needs could be at play here? Or could or my child possibly have an accumulation of stress or tension that might be at play here? So, um, and then from there is to use these democratic parenting methods because all of them work together simultaneously uh, and synergistically to meet all the 15 childhood needs and to reduce and to heal stress, okay? So it all works together to help the child be more clear thinking, to have better judgment, and to have a, a really positive, enthusiastic zest for life so they can enjoy participating and enjoy cooperating with you or their their, um, their the other students in school or their teacher or basically in life, okay? So they get more interested and enthusiastic and zestful about life and they and they resist less and they're less defiant okay so that's that's um, that's what I that's my best kind of um, recommendation I can give you Anisha I hope that's helpful I totally agree thank you Oh, okay I'm glad I'm glad that was helpful for you thanks Anisha and Tammy asks is the house rule for six-year-old must finish homework before watching TV considered a bribe yes uh, and no okay so it depends how you set this up. So what you can do is you can, if you set it up as a routine, okay, that uh, the, the routine of the day is that you do get some television time. Um, and But before that, part of the routine is to do the homework. And so, you know, and before that, you know, you have your afternoon after school snack. And then after TV, you know, you wash up and then we have dinner. And so if, if, the, if the schoolwork and the television or the screen time are just two parts of a large routine that you can move through without stress or tension, then no, it doesn't have to be a bribe. But if you hold it over your child's head, um, you know, as a, as a type of, um, you know, as they can't do that until they do this, then it can be a bribe. But I would say if you set it up in, ter in terms of a routine as just being, you know, one thing goes to the next, and of course, they can't move on to the television or the screen time until they finish their homework or until they finish their chores. You know, they can't go outside and play until they finish such and such. Then it's not a bribe at all. It's just part of our, our kind of group responsibilities, our normal routine. So um, I hope that was helpful for you, Tammy. Okay, so that's all the questions that we've had today. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining this live webinar. It's a real honor for me to... Um, to, uh, to share this information with you and uh, 
and then and to and to answer all these wonderful questions and to interact with you. It's been a real joy for me. And I hope that you can all make it to my webinar next week on um, on Thursday. I'll be going through uh, dealing with anger and and um, aggression and violence in children. And then in February, also we're doing a webinar on childhood stress disorder. And we have our, our parent leadership certification five-week training happening in, in February as well. And um, we have lots of new stuff too coming up at uh, parentlearningclub.com. We'll have a new site website coming up real soon. I'll send you an email out for that, so watch for that. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to email us at support at parentlearningclub.com. Uh, I do get a lot of those forwarded to me, and I enjoy those a lot. So again, it was a real pleasure to be on this call with you, and you're all such amazing parents that I really bow down to you, and I know that together we can truly build a brighter future. Thank you so much.